In 2016, about 20% of us adults had chronic pain. That's about 50 million people. And 8% of those adults had high impact pain. And that's about 20 million people with debilitating chronic pain. Hi, I'm Dr. Chuck Betters, and I am the host of this Help and Hope resource, this podcast produced by Marking Ministries. Now, people who are suffering from high impact pain, oh, they often suffer in isolation without much understanding or sympathy. Uh, they don't have a cast or any visible sign of injury, yet their pain changes the way they live their life. Today, I'm talking with Bill Condon, a friend of mine who knows what it is to not only experience chronic pain with really no hope of healing, but also the devastation of the losses that often accompanies chronic pain. Yet Bill's story is one of hope. I hope you hear that in this in this podcast. Bill, thank you for your willingness to share your journey with the goal of offering help and hope, not just to those who are suffering with pain, but also to the people who love them. But before we jump into your story, tell us a little bit about your life right now. I'm married. We have five children. They are range in age from 27 to 37. Three of them are married. We have three grandchildren right now with a, a fourth one on the way. Mostly what I do nowadays is, is help the kids out. I'm the go-to mm-hmm. person for babysitting and for dog watching. We're so grateful that you're willing to take this time to share your story. So, Bill, you suffer from chronic pain. You're one of those people that I mentioned who has debilitating chronic pain. I'm just going to turn this over to you now for you to tell your story, not only of your journey with pain, but of your spiritual struggles, the emotional struggles that that accompany it. So why don't you start from the beginning and tell us your story? My chronic pain journey began in 1997. I was 45 at the time. Like I said, married with five children. I was 20 years into a good job. And I started the year off with a large kidney stone. It was the second kidney stone I had in 10 years. It was so large it wouldn't pass on its own. So they had to take it out. I healed up, went back to work. But I noticed a few months later, I still had a moderate ache that wouldn't go away. I ended up in a surgeon's office and he examined me and said, it's probably a hernia. And oh, by the way, you have a hernia on the other side as well, which I didn't know I had hernias. So we scheduled double hernia surgery in October of 97. It was supposed to have the surgery, heal up, go back to work. Well, it didn't happen that way. I came out of that surgery in the worst pain in my life. I would say that pain was 10 on a scale of zero to 10. I couldn't get up off the gurney and get dressed and go home. They kept me overnight, gave me morphine. It didn't help. And I just suffered recovering from that pain. And about six weeks after the surgery, I noticed I had more pain than I had before the surgery. On both sides of my abdomen, where they did the hernia repair, I now had constant uncomfortable pain. The surgeon couldn't figure out why. So three months and six months after the original hernia surgery, I had follow-up surgeries. And that's when they discovered these large blocks of scar tissue, four inches long, four inches deep, one inch thick. The scar tissue, which I felt it on inside me when you didn't know where to tie a shoe, I could feel this mass inside and trapped all the nerves in the region. And that's what was leaving me in constant pain. And that meant every physical movement I made from sitting, bending, walking, standing was going to irritate those nerves and cause constant pain. I went to a pain clinic. They tried a nerve block in my abdomen that didn't work. He tried another injection that didn't work. I switched surgeons the following year. He did two exploratory surgeries. He took out the scar and yet it still grew back again. The following year after that, I had two more exploratory surgeries where they The two surgeons together, they were in the same practice, but they were surmising, maybe I'm reacting to the mesh that was used to repair the original hernias. So the last two surgeries, they took the mesh out and then repaired the hernia without mesh. And it didn't make any difference. The scar tissue still grew back. I was beginning to lose hope at that point. 
because I felt like I it, it had exhausted any medical avenues I could go down in Delaware. The surgeons didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to direct me or where I should look. I mean, they felt sorry for me and said, good luck, and, but no direction. So a friend of mine, somewhat suggested I should look into Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, that they had an excellent pain clinic. So I had my surgeon, original surgeon, send a request letter to Hopkins, and they agreed to see me. So I went down there for a visit. They seemed like they fully understood the problem that surgery wasn't the answer, and they were going to do a series of injections, as many as it took, to get me relief. And it sounded like a great plan. My hope was revived, and I was thinking, this is going to be it now. This is going to give me relief. I went there for six months. Every two weeks, so I had 12 injections. Ten of those injections did nothing at all. One injection gave me 12 hours relief, and the last injection must have got outside the scar tissue because I still felt where that needle went in two weeks later. And according to Hopkins' philosophy, if they cause additional pain to you by their procedures, they terminate your treatment. I guess it gives them a high success rate if they get rid of their failures. Well, that's what happened. So they, they just terminated my treatment. They sent me back to the original surgeon and said, treat with pain meds. Up to this point, when people ask me in this pain journey, this has been like over four years at that point. And every time people ask me, are you trusting God in this? Of course I'm trusting God. But in retrospect, I was trusting God to give me relief or to at least minimize the pain. And that didn't happen. And I wasn't prepared for that. At that point, I became so depressed that I was looking at the rest of my life in chronic pain. I felt if, if that was what it had to be, I didn't want to live. I didn't want to commit suicide. Uh, I didn't own a gun. I couldn't cut myself. I thought the only thing I thought I could do, I could jump off something, a bridge or a building, but I didn't want my family knowing that I committed suicide. I didn't want them to live with that stigma. So I was devising in my mind, how could I kill myself and make it look like an accident? And at least that way, they, they wouldn't know it was suicide, and my life insurance policy would pay off. Some of them don't pay if you commit suicide. That was the mindset I was in. I didn't plan a date on when I was going to do it, but that I was going to do it. And God brought a friend to me, but he called me on the phone. This couple that Nancy and I knew, we socialized a lot with when we were younger. When we were raising our kids, they had four, we had five. We spent a lot of time together. But as the kids got older, schedules got busier. We didn't see each other as much. But he would call me once in a while. And it had been a while since he called me. Well, he phoned me one night. He could tell from that conversation what I was saying in my attitude that I was not in a good place. He was, he was literally afraid that I was going to do something. So he asked me if I would go to counseling if he went with me. I said yes, because. I didn't think it would make any difference. I was just being polite to him. I thought my mind's made up, but I'll go. I knew the counselor from church. We went and had a visit. I explained to him my situation. He gave me one assignment. He says, I want you to go home and every day I want you to read from Psalms. Just Psalms. Don't read anything else in the Bible except Psalms. And number two, I want you to write down what, what you're reading, what your thoughts are, what your feelings are. Keep a journal. So I started doing that. And that first week, I felt revived by what I was reading in, in Psalms. Almost like the feeling I had when I first became a Christian in high school and read the Bible for the very first time. It was almost like that. I went back after one week and the counselor was like, you're good to go. You don't need me anymore. You're on the right path. And I felt like I was on the right path. I felt like thoughts of suicide were gone. They never, they've never come back since then. I was on the right path, but I still had questions. I still have to live with chronic pain. And I guess my, my inner thought was, how shall I then live? What, what do I do? How do I deal with this? How do I live with this? I wanted more direction from God. And I, I, I'd heard about a book that someone wrote where the title was, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? I didn't read the book. The title really bothered me. Because I had to ask myself this question, is my chronic pain a bad thing? If I say yes, then God is the author of doing bad things to me. 
And I knew that didn't fit with scripture that, that I do. So if it's not that, then what is it? And in my daily readings, I found myself reading in Job. Now, everyone knows Job is the suffering servant. He lost his children and all his possessions. He still praised God, but then God allowed him to be in chronic physical pain, extreme pain with boils all over his body. His wife says something first to Job, and she says, curse God and die. Now, I'd read that in the past, and I, I guess in a naive way, I kind of thought if he cursed God out loud, God would strike him dead. And that's what she meant by curse God and die. But this time I read it, and then I thought she could mean, she could possibly be meaning curse God and kill yourself. Curse God for putting you in this condition and then end your life because you can't live with this pain. And then initially, that's how I felt. But Job's response to his wife was, shall we not accept God's blessings as well as his adversity? And it was like the first light bulb went off for me when he called it adversity. So it wasn't a bad thing happening to me. It was adversity. Much in the same way as in the Old Testament when Moses and would speak to the Israelites and say, God allowed all these things to happen to you to test you, to see what was in your heart, whether you whether you would obey him or not. So I was looking at my chronic pain in, in that aspect, that it was an adversity God is allowing into my life as a test. That changed my mind a lot on what the pain was. But I still had a question about whether the hernia surgery was the right thing to do. When I used to work, I worked for a major copier company, and I would go to some office buildings occasionally, and they would send someone to the lobby and then escort you to the copier. And we'd go down a hallway and around cubicles until we arrived at the copier. Well, my pain journey, to me, felt like Jesus leading me through an office building, and he's saying, follow me, follow me. We go down a hallway. It's, it's brightly lit. We get to a door and we go through that door and picture a room that's like three miles long. And we start walking further into that room. And Jesus keeps saying, follow me, follow me. And I'm trying to follow him. Walking around these cubicles, he's getting further ahead of me. I keep looking back at the doorway we came in. It's getting farther and farther away. And the light is getting dimmer because there's no light in this room. And eventually I get to the point where it's pitch black. I can't see Jesus anymore. I can't see the door anymore. And that's where, where at the point I was at when I felt like suicide was the answer. The pain also felt to me like another word picture would be if I'm sitting in the living room on my couch and the pain is this seven foot cube sitting in the room. Well, that would pretty much take up the whole room, seven feet cube. But now I'm reading the Bible. I'm seeing God speak to me through some certain verses. And in that word picture, the hallway was my life before hernia surgery. The door was the decision to have surgery. And then the, the journey into that dark room was where everything medically failed. Everything that was tried failed. This time, from reading scripture, I came across Psalm 139, how it describes how God intimately knew us and created us in the womb. But there was a, a a verse in that chapter where it says, in thy book, they were written all the days of my life before I hadn't lived one of them. Before I even lived day one, God knew what was going to happen in the, in the days of my life. And that spoke to me about that decision to have surgery. Because I was also thinking in terms of a lifeline. If I drew my life as a lifeline from the day I was born. And you draw a straight line across the page and you have all the events in your life that happened along the way until I got the chronic pain. And then I thought that the line somehow is gone down at an angle, that my life had been permanently changed by chronic pain. And it, in some ways, I was resentful. I was envious. I was angry. Like, why did you have to do that to me? Why can't I go back on that straight line and live my life the way I was? That verse in Psalm 139 said all those days were recorded before I even lived day one. So that gave me the conviction that God planned this. He allowed that surgery to happen on that day. It was the right decision. 
So I changed my attitude about that lifeline. It's now still a straight lifeline because God hasn't changed before the surgery or after the surgery. He's still the same God to me. I've heard people use the phrase, this is my new normal now. When something happens in their life, some adversity happens and they say, this is my new normal. Well, I don't choose to look at it that way. Me, my old normal was before I knew Christ. A new normal is with Christ. Whatever happens on that lifeline, it's with Christ. With that. And that was beginning to change my whole perspective. Another passage that God showed me it was in Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 13, 14. Consider the works of God, for who can straighten what he has been? In the day of blessing, I'll be happy, but in the day of adversity, consider that God has made the one as well as the other. That verse spoke to me about all the medical procedures that were tried to fix my condition. I mean, the doctors, the pain doctors, the surgeons, they all shook their head and said, we've never seen this before. We don't know how to help you. Well, that verse in Ecclesiastes was saying, God bent me. He bent my life with chronic pain. And they all tried to straighten it, and they couldn't because it was God's plan to bend me. And that, that gave me comfort in a sense that I wasn't looking to the medical community anymore for hope or for a solution. God was the one I was supposed to look, look to. And going back to that analogy of walking into that dark room where I originally felt that Jesus led me into this dark room and abandoned me. Now I looked at it and said, God took me that far into that room with all those medical procedures and everyone trying to do what they're supposed to do that's supposed to work and it didn't work. God did that intentionally to drain all those things out of my life so that I wasn't hoping for the next procedure or the next doctor or the next whatever, that my hope had to be completely in God and no human person. That's you know how I felt after that illustration. Jesus didn't lead me into that room to abandon me. He led me in there to make sure that I was at the end of my rope so that he could then turn around and start filling me up. That other picture about sitting on the couch with the seven foot cube in the room of pain. I also pictured now reading all these passages that God was speaking to me about as if I would turn my head to the right and realize that Jesus was sitting on the couch with me the whole time. And he says, take up your cross and follow me. When Jesus was with his disciples, he never told Peter to take up John's cross and follow him. He never told Matthew to take up Andrew's cross. He says, take up your cross. I have a cross designed for you. You need to pick it up and follow me. I believe every Christian has a cross to bear, one way, shape, form, or another. And God designed that cross for you particularly. We don't bear other people's crosses. We bear our own. And the second thing that Jesus was going to tell me on that couch Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. A yoke is for two. And Jesus is saying, this is my yoke. So he's on one side of it, and he's asking me to come along the other side. Put that yoke around my head and start walking with him, learning from him. And that seven-foot cube of pain, when I turn back from looking at Jesus on that couch, that pain is now a one-foot square box on the table. It's not a seven-foot cube in the room. I, I was giving that pain so much power over me. And in reality, it wasn't. I, I'm kind of surprised that you actually can get used to certain pain in your life. When it's permanent and you start living with it for years, you actually start getting used to some of it. And it's not as powerful as I was giving it at the beginning. So I keep reading, and, and these verses God was sharing with me were happening over years. It didn't happen all at once, but the final verse that, that God showed me I was reading in Jeremiah. The nation of Israel is taken captive by Babylon. They were taken out of their homeland to the nation of Babylon. They're in captivity. One of their false prophets says to the Israelites, we're only going to be here for two years. God told me two years and we're we're done we're going to go back home jeremiah was the true prophet and god spoke through jeremiah and jeremiah said 
it's not going to be two years. It's going to be 70 years. And literally every adult that heard him say that, that meant the rest of their life. If they were in their 20s, 70 years put you in your 90s. You may not live that long. So he was telling them, the rest of your life, you're going to be here in Babylon. So while you're here, build houses, live in your houses, plant gardens, grow food, get married, let your sons marry, let your daughters marry, have grandchildren, and be at peace with the nation that took you captive. For in their peace, you will have peace. And what he was saying to the Israelites, learn to live in your captivity and be at peace. I mean, their, their alternative, I'm sure they would have loved it to only be two years. And if it was two, I could see them being in contention with Babylon and fighting against them and not cooperating and making trying to make Babylon's life miserable. But God says, I put you in this captivity. You're going to be here for 70 years. Get used to it. Learn to live your life in peace. Then we get to verse 11 in chapter 29. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We we'll use that verse all the time, but I think they don't realize what the context is before it. And so here I am reading it in constant pain. That was my Babylon. I'm in captivity. But God says, you need to be at peace with this captivity. You can still live your life. That was the build houses, plant gardens, you know, let your children marry. And God was telling me to be at peace in my chronic pain. He's with me. He's the other half of the yoke. This is his plan for me. And all these verses were, were comforting me more and more in improving my relationship with God. I went from the, the verge of suicide to now being in this deeper relationship with God that I wasn't in before. The pain has a way of pushing you to God. Every time I feel pain, it's a push towards God, to, t- to talk to God. A lot of times in my mind, I feel pain in my body, and my mind just says, you and me, Lord, you and me, we'll get through this. My head's in the yoke next to you. We'll get through it together. Now, if I could regress, when I became a Christian as a a senior in high school, my family never went to church. But there was a man at at this job where I had a part-time job. He was originally from Barbados. He came to the United States as a young man. He was married with two little kids, very outgoing. I was very introverted. He kept asking me questions every day on the job, about my life, about school. He was a joyful person. And he also kept inviting me to the youth group at his church. And I resisted as long as I could, but his persistence wore me down. I agreed to go to the youth group, and I saw these kids at this church with the same joy that Spencer had. And they talked about God, they sang songs, they read the Bible, and I thought, this is all new to me. I've never seen this before. Well, back in my own high school, I had a a history teacher, and he says, I want everybody to do one more research paper before you graduate. And the topic is wide open. Do anything you want. But at first, I didn't know what to do. And then the thought came to me, why don't I do something about Spencer's church? So my report was the role of the Christian church in American society. So once I told Spencer, he says, oh, you should talk to the pastor. So he lined up a meeting with the pastor. And I met the pastor, asked him questions, and then he asked me questions. And we looked at John 3.16, and on the basis of that verse, became a Christian. Well, a few years later, I joined the Air Force. I ended up in Delaware. Somebody back in New Jersey calls me and says, Spencer had a personal injury, a severe injury. He was changing one of these long fluorescent bulbs, three, four feet long, slipped out of his fingers and exploded in his face. He washed his face and washed his eyes. He thought he was good to go, but I believe it was maybe a month's time and he lost his eyesight. He was totally blind. I made arrangements to go meet him for lunch and I was shocked that he was still a joyful person, that he was when he had eyesight. And I remember thinking, If that happened to me, there's no way I'd be joyful. He shared one verse with me, Psalm 119.92. If the law had not been my delight, it would have perished in my affliction. And there's another verse close to it in verse 50, 119.50. 
This is my comfort in my affliction, that thy word has revived me. Revived could also mean preserved me alive. Well, I originally marked verse 92 as Spencer's verse after going blind. That's what I wrote in my Bible. Now, so many years later, I'm in chronic pain, and I come across that same verse. If God's word, not my delight, I would have perished my affliction. And it reemphasized to me so strongly how much God used his word to revive me, keep me alive from committing suicide and changing my life, drawing me into a closer relationship, a relationship that I wouldn't have had if it wasn't for the chronic pain. Now, the pain is still pain. I'm still in pain. It's, it's actually has gotten worse over the last five, seven years than it was before that. In some ways, the pain feels like a ball and chain around your ankle. You know, you drag it everywhere you go. You're still free to move, but you're limited on how you can move. It changes how you walk. Sometimes the pain feels like a prison. Like, again, you, I don't look like I have a disability. I'm free to move around, but I'm going to be in pain. I can't get away from the pain. The pain is still there. But it's a, it's a pain that I can tolerate. There's um, two other passages that God showed me in Psalms. One in chapter 30, verse 7, and there's a phrase in there that says, you have made my mountain to stand strong. And that spoke to me that the pain I'm in, God has made me strong enough to endure that pain. And the second verse, Psalm 18, verse 16, 17, you've kept me from my strong enemy. And that said to me, God knows how much pain I can endure, how much I could live with. And he knows how much would destroy me and push me to suicide. So he's kept me from the stronger pain and he's made me to stand strong in the pain I'm in. And that's basically where I'm at right now. I mean, I've accepted the pain in my life. Uh, I'm at peace with it. I'm still living my life, doing things that I can do. I know what limitations I have. This certain physical activity is going to make the pain worse. Sometimes I can avoid that activity. Sometimes I can't. And when the, the pain escalates, I would say right now, well, the pain I'm living in is between five and seven on that scale. It, it's seven at its worst. When it gets to that point, I just have to relax and limit what I do, pain to settle back down. I've been on pain medicine for 17 years plus, seven or eight different kinds of pain medicine. None of it takes the pain away. Not a single one has ever taken the pain away. What they do is tend to dampen the increase in pain so the pain doesn't shoot up right away. I don't get high. Sometimes I forget to take the pain pills. So I'm not addicted. I know I'm not addicted to them because I don't feel anything from taking them. I know when I forget to take them because something as simple as just getting off the couch and going to the bathroom hurts more than it did two hours before. And then I realized I didn't take my pills yet. So I'm not an addict with the pills, but I depend on them. The pain would be worse without the pills. And that's where I'm at today. You have quite a story, Bill, when it comes to the relationship between our suffering and the, and the scriptures. It seems as though the scriptures have spoken to you directly, but a man or a woman in pain, any kind of pain, has to be committed to the scriptures because that's where we find our hope that, that's mm-hmm. where we find our food. That's where we find our peace. And your story is such a powerful story for those out there who are struggling with chronic pain. Like I said at the beginning, maybe somebody's walking around out there, they don't have a cast on their arm or they don't have a neck brace or a cane or a wheelchair, but they are suffering. And their, their pain is something that they have to live with. But you've chosen to live with your pain in the context of your relationship with Christ. You mentioned a book at the beginning, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. That was written by a Jewish man who self-professes that he's not even a believer. And the book comes up dry. Uh, The book at the end comes up with no answers. Your story, however, comes up with some very specific answers. Bill, I wanna thank you for being so transparent and for giving us such a hope-filled story. For those of you who are listening, I'm Dr. Chuck Betters. You have been listening in on a conversation with Bill Condon, a friend of mine 
who loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his heart. We would love to hear from you. I know Bill would also love to hear from you if his story has in any way encouraged you in your own life journey. Uh, we hope this message of the message of our of our conversation is clear that God is sovereign and you can trust him even in the darkest places of life. I want to thank you Bill for being willing to share. I want to thank those of you who are listening to this resource. I want to thank you for caring enough to listen and I hope it has been helpful. And what we like to say around here is to God be the glory and may he richly bless you.